Today's stuff we're going to be learning is Nazir, Daf Nun Zion. Today's staff is sponsored by Nancy Kaladni in honor of Lisa Kaladni on her birthday with appreciation and love to my amazing daughter-in-law. May your learning and chesed continue to grow in the new year. Today's staff is sponsored by Ricky and Alan Zibit in loving memory of Helen Zibit, Hannah Bat Yaakov Rachel Leah on her 23rd year at site. Mom, we miss your warmth and love every day. And in honor of the birthdays of our dear daughter-in-law, Devorah Cohen Zibit and son-in-law, Jay Blumenreich, who have enriched our family in countless beautiful ways. We love you both so much. We are now going to get started. Um, reminder to register for the SEUM. Um, the, there's details up on our site about the about the SEUMs, both in Israel on the Hebrew side, um, in on the Zoom SEUM in English. The Hebrew SEUM is also in Zoom. Um, Hebrew SEUM taking place, at least the one in Ranana that I'll be speaking at with the Zoom with Rabbi El Shimoni will be on Wednesday. Some of the others will be during the week in different days. And we also have um, Rabbi Chamutal. Shoval from Daf Mishalahen, if you follow that in Hebrew on our um, for the last number of years, she'll be speaking in Manhattan uh, at a CM for Hadran. So if you're around Manhattan and you'd like to go, um, details of that have been posted around. If you don't have details, you can email us uh, at info at hadran.org.il. Okay, getting started with our Daf. We have a bit of an interesting Daf today. Um, we're leaving the basic laws of Tumantara, even though we are still going to be in laws of Tumantara, but not as much the nitty gritty um, grotesque details of the bones and all that. We're going to finish off that right now. We ended with it, and then we'll start the seventh chapter, which is all about different Sveikot. We already got a little bit of, a, of an in into what's going to be in the next chapter in yesterday's daf, when we saw that whole case of someone who's a Nazir, who maybe was impure, who maybe had leprosy. We'll get to that case. Today, we're going to start with a different case of case of doubt and end with an interesting story of Rav Huna's wife. So starting with uh, the Mishnah from yesterday. In the Mishnah yesterday, Rabbi Akiva had a whole question about the Ravid Dam. He basically disagreed with the law that a quarter log of blood, does, if, uh, if someone comes in physical contact with, touches or moves rather than in a tent, he thinks that a Nazir should shave for that. Okay, that, that would cause the Nazir to be at the level of impurity that would need shaving, sacrifices, etc. Whereas our Mishnah said not. So Rabbi Kiva said, it's simple Kavachomer logic. What's the Kavachomer logic? Well, Etzem Kiseora is a, is a less stringent halacha. The bone the size of a barley is less strict, less stringent than Rivitam. How do we know that? Because in regular laws of impurity, if you have a bone the size of a barley in a house or a tent, it won't make everything impure. But if you have a quarter log of blood in a tent from a dead body, it will make everything impure in that tent. So since Ravi Dam is more strict and the bone does pass on impurity and cause the Nazir to shave for it if the Nazir comes in physical contact with it, then wouldn't you think the same would be true for this quarter log of blood? However, basically the answer that he gets that Rabbi, the, um, when Rabbi Akiva says this, and they said, I brought it in front of Rabbi Yeshua, Rabbi Akiva says, he says, Rabbi Yeshua said to me, malta, You said very nicely, but it's a halacha l'mosh mesina. Right? It's a tradition, and we don't go against these traditions. Now, what exactly is the tradition? So yesterday I explained that the tradition is that the Ravi Dam is halacha l'mosh mesina, that it doesn't make the Nazir shave. But the Gemara, in the end, doesn't actually agree with what I said, and suggests first, maybe it's that, maybe it's something else, and is going to answer that it's actually something else. So that's what we're going to see right now in this little section of the Gemara before we finish the chapter. Ibayelehu, top of our daf, they asked a question. When he said, it's halacha, and therefore you can't learn it from a kavachomer, is it etzem keseora halacha? Is the fact that a bone the size of a barley is going to make the nazir shave, maybe that's the halacha, that's the tradition. And if that's the tradition, revi dam kavachomer, we're trying to learn from there to a kavachomer in the revidam, because again, etzem is lenient and revidam is more strict, so whatever's true for the lenient should be true for the more strict. Well, ain't a name kavachomer mehalacha. And then we would say that what Rabbi Yeshua is telling him is if something is learned out by a halacha lemoshim isina, which basically often it means we don't really know why this is, but it means you can't apply logic to that, you can't apply logical argumentation to something that is a halacha l'mosh mesinai. 
So if this is Allah Lamash Messina, you can't derive from there any sort of Kabachomer because there's no logic to it, basically. It doesn't work on the logical plane. So you can't say, oh, that's lenient and yet has a strict halacha, so the one that's strict should have also a strict halacha, because that's lenient and has a strict halacha, but that whole is, thing is only because it's halacha l'mosh misinai, and therefore you can't, <coughs> you can't learn anything from it. O Dilma, that's one option. O Dilma, or is it the way I said yesterday, which is, revi dam is halacha, the fact that you don't shave for a nazir, on a quarter loke of blood, even if you touch it, is a tradition. And etzem ksora kava chomer, which means theoretically you might want to do this kava chomer from etzem ksora to revitam, but you can't because ain't anim kava chomer mehalacha. But you can't do a kava chomer to derive something that goes against a tradition. That's the way we understood it yesterday, option two. But interestingly, the Gemara is going to choose option one. And the Gemara is going to say, not like we explained it yesterday, but Tashma, let's learn from here. There's a Brayta that reads like this. Etzem kesora halacha, the fact that etzem, the size of a barley, a bone the size of a barley, will make the Nazir shave if coming in contact with it, that is halacha mosh mesinai. And revi dam is a kavachomer. Revi dam, you might want to learn kavachomer from there, but you can't because ain't anim kavachomer mehalacha. So there you have it, different from the way we understood it yesterday. Now we're going to understand it the opposite way, which is it's the Revi Dam that's the Halacha. It still means the same thing. It still means you can't learn from one to the other. It's just a different reason is why you can't learn, right? The, the thing we said yesterday is if the Halacha conflicts with the tradition that's learned out, in other words, we have this, I'm sorry, if the logic conflicts with the tradition, the conclusion of the logic conflicts with the tradition, it's a problem. Now we're saying it's not the conclusion. It's that you can't even make a logical argument starting with Halacha Lamosh Messina because it's not logical. It's just this halacha that we have passed down that we might not really understand it, in which case we can't start deriving anything from it because it's, it's unique, kind of standalone. And with that, Hadron Alach Kohen Gadol, and we'll start our new chapter all about Sveikot. Doubts, cases of doubt. So, Shnei Nizirim, okay, there's two Nizirim, Sha'amar Lahem Echad. A person comes along and says to these two Nizirim, Ra'iti Echam Echem Shenitma. I saw that one of you became impure. But I'm not sure which one. So somehow they didn't realize they, be, they became impure. But he said, I saw the two of you, you know, whether he's not sure if one went into a tent, that there was a dead body and he's not sure which one. He saw them only from the back and he's not sure. And they didn't know who it was or I don't know how, what the case could be. But somehow he saw maybe he saw a dead, you know, one stepped on a dead bone and they didn't notice. But he's not sure which one it was. Okay, either he knew at some point now forgot or he just never really saw well enough to know who it was. So now what do they do? We have one who's a suffix, one is a nazir, they're both nazirim, definitely. But one was impure. Now, if he was impure, he would need to go through shaving another time, sacrifices, right? Different set of sacrifices for the nazir who becomes impure. And then obviously doing another 30 days, but we don't know who it is. So what do we do? Classic case of sveiko. So what are, mevi'im korban tuma. So they both shave. And they bring a korban tuma. Obviously, when do they do this? After 30 days. Because if you weren't the one who was impure, then you're obviously forbidden to shave for 30 days. So even though if you were definitely a nazir who became impure, you would bring your sacrifice as soon as you finished your seven days of, of purity. In this case, they have to wait. So basically, how did they do? How did they bring a korban? So we're going to see. Okay, so you're asking. You're going to see exactly how they do it. So they bring between the two of them. This is how it works. Between the two of them, they bring, okay, let's even talk about it outside this before we read it. Theoretically, we're a lot, between the two of them, how, what do we need to bring? We need to bring one set of Nazir sacrifices of impurity and two sets of purity. So that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to bring the exact amount of sacrifices and make stipulations. We've seen these kind of stipulations in sacrifices before. So this is how you do it. They bring a korban tuma vi korban tara. So between the two of them, they bring two sets of, right, one set of korban tuma, one set of korban tara, ve omer. Im anihu tame, he says the following, if I'm the one who's impure, korban tuma sheli. So then this set between the two of us that we're bringing of impurity, the one that's for impurity is mine. Ve korban tara shalcha. And yours is the purity one, is the one of completion of nizigu. And if it's the reverse, and I'm the one who's pure, the korban tuma shalcha, 
Then the set of impurity is mine, of purity finishing this is mine, and the tumma is yours. This sofrim, Becky, you're asking all the questions that we're going to get to today, so have no fears. This sofrim shloshimio, and then you count thirty days. Why do you count thirty days? Well, because one of them needs to be a nazir for another thirty days because he only brought his impurity sacrifices. So we still need another 30 days. So both of them, out of a case of doubt, since we don't know which is which, both of them have to keep another 30 days of Nizirut, so they can't drink wine, they can't become pure to death, they can't cut their hair, etc. And then what do they do? At the end of the 30 days, Mevi'im Korban Tara, they bring one set of purity, right? Because remember, what do we say? You need two sets of completion of Nizirut, because they're both Nizirim, and one set of, of impurity. So they brought already two of the three, one of purity, one of impurity, and now they need to bring the third one. Veil mail. And again, they make the following stipulation. Now notice, by the way, it doesn't say at this point that they shave. You notice that? It says they shave in the beginning. It doesn't say anything about shaving here. We're going to get back to that later in the Gemara, although there's a little bit of confusion about things later on. Veil mail. And then they say, Imaniu atame, if I'm the one who was impure, then, and they go through now a whole description of the history. Then, Korban Tumasheli, then the last time we brought sacrifices, the impurity one was mine, the Korban Tarashelcha, and the completion one was yours. So you don't really need anything yet. And Ze Korban Tarati, the one that we're bringing out together, is mine. The Im Ani but if I'm, I'm sorry, yeah, and, but if I'm the one who was pure from the beginning and wasn't the one who was impure, Korban Tarasheli, then last time I already gave my completed, my, 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 uh, sacrifices of completion. And the one last time was yours for the impurity. And now you're the one who's obligated in the sacrifice, so it's yours. Okay, so we have a very good solution as to how to bring, we don't need to bring any extra sets because you can't bring sets out of doubt, right? It's sacrifice. You can't bring sacrifices we already learned for no reason. The other issue, as Becky pointed out, is going to be the shaving. Why is the shaving a problem? Because you're not allowed to shave your pay out. Right? And the Nazir has to shave all of his hair, including the Pe'o. Now, that's only allowed if you're actually a definitive Nazir. So the Mishnah actually seems to have it pretty good because the Mishnah says they both shave the first time, but they don't shave the second time. However, the Gemara is not going to understand it that way. The Gemara, maybe it's unclear what the Gemara understands, but perhaps the Gemara is going to understand that even though it doesn't say you shave at the second stage, you do shave at the second stage. And then we're going to have a bit of a question how on earth are you allowed to shave? So even though the simple reading of the Mishnah seems to say they only shave the first stage, they're going to seem, at least according to some commentaries, that the Gemara is going to seem to believe that you even shave at a later stage. So now the Gemara asks, before we get even to that, the first question of the Gemara is very simple. There's a concept, it's simple if you understand this concept, there's a concept, I'm going to read this all inside in a minute, but I'll explain it outside first. We're going to learn it from Sota, it comes up many times in the Gemara. Now it's nice because we're leading into Sota. What's the case of a sota? A case of a sota is a case where a man is jealous of his wife, that she's been talking to some man, and he warns her, don't go into a room alone with him, and then she goes into a room alone with him. And then, basically, she's called a sota at that point, and she has to drink the sota waters, right? There's a whole process that happens. We'll get into all the details. Because she did this issue wrong, and basically, she's considered, the Torah calls her, nitme'a. She's become, she's impure. Now, she's not impure, impurity, like coming in contact with the dead. But it's the same way they call non-kosher food tame. They call a woman who was basically convicted of being a sota. She's nitma. Now, we're strict with her. In other words, it's still a case of doubt. We don't really know what happened in that room. But she was in a room alone with a man, and we're concerned enough to make her right, do this whole process. Um, we're concerned enough that we're going to be, sh- it's basically a case of suffix, a doubt. We don't know whether it's true or not. And we're going to be strict. Where does that case transpire? In public or in private? Obviously in private. It was her alone in a room with a man. So the, they learn from this. This basically builds a paradigm for cases of impurity that are doubtful situations like ours, for example. Or we have, we have a case where someone is safe, is a tame, impure, out of a doubt. The general principle is if we have a doubt about a case of impurity, if it was in a private space, which today we'll define a little bit what is private, what is public. Like you might think, let's go back to, right, they call it Rashida Yachid and Rashida Rabin. Like that sounds reminiscent of Eruvin and, and, uh, and Shabbat, but we're going to define a little differently here. If it was in a private space and we have a doubt about a case of impurity, we're going to be strict, just like the Sota. 
But if there's a case of a doubt of impurity in a public space, we're going to be lenient and say, it's definitely tahor, we don't need to worry about it. So that's going to be the Gemara's question, because why? Katane, it says here in our Mishnah, Shnei Nizirim, Shamar Laim Echad, Ra'iti Echabikem Shenitma, Ve'en Yodei Ezemikem, we have two Nizirim, one person saw and said, one of you is impure, and I don't know which one. Am I? Why is this? Kol Safei Tumah Bereshuri Yechi, Mehecha Yafin Ama. Where do we learn this whole issue of Safei Tumah in a private domain? Misota, from the Sota. Now, let's define what is private space for the Sota. Masota bo el v'niv elet, who is in that room? The one who supposedly have relations with her and the woman who have who he have relations with. That's the niv elet. Af kol sefek tumah b'rishut ha'yachid ki gon de'ika be'tre. What is a sefek that's like that in a rishut ha'yachid? It's not just about what type of domain was it. It's how many people were there. So how many people were there? Two. So any case where there's two people and no more, right? We know this from, let's say, laws of Lashon Hara also, or what we call Rechilu, telling something that some, if somebody tells you something, they said it in front of two people, we consider that private. Once they tell three people, we just know word's going to get around. They knew that word was going to get around, and basically it's public information. So things that are with two people are still private. Things with three people are public, and we learn it particularly from the Sota, that there were two people there. But our case had three people. We had the two Nizirim who were in doubt, and we had the person who saw them. So there were three people in that space. Now, what's defined as space is a good question. Some people say it has to be they were within four cubits of each other, or they were in an enclosed space. We don't know exactly. But it seems that these three people were together, and therefore would be public. Now, public, suffix to in public, we just said, you're pure. So you shouldn't have to worry at all about this whole, the whole mission is irrelevant. So what do they answer? Right, so again, um, there were there were three. I'm not sure if I read all these words. So have a safek tumah berushit arabim. It's safek tumah in a public domain. Bechol safek tumah berushit arabim sfekot tahor. And every safek tumah in a public space is pure. To which Amarav Baravuna, Amarav Baravuna explains that the Mishnah is in a unique case. This is what we always call an ukimta. The Mishnah is not in any case where there's three people there. It would have to be in the following situation. Be'omel, where he says, Ra'iti tum'ashen izreka benechem. The third person wasn't close to them. How far, we don't know. But he was at a distance, and he said, I saw some tumma that fell upon you. In other words, I saw it from a distance. Maybe that, and, and that's what Ravashi is going to say. I'm a Ravashi, daikanami. You can even infer that from the wording of the Mishnah, as we move now to Amubet. Dekatane eini yodea ezemikem. Shmamina. Here's the proof. Proof is in the pudding. Why? He says, I don't know which one of you. Why doesn't he know which one of him? Because he wasn't close enough to them. He must have been at a distance. And that's why this case ends up being. So our first issue is a very side issue, which is, it's not side, it's pretty essential, but it's basically saying, why is there even, why do we even treat this doubt seriously in this case? Isn't it a suffix tuma in Rashid Arabim? In which case we don't, in a public domain, in which case we don't have, an, it shouldn't be an issue at all. So they basically define it as a Rishud Yachid. It must be a private, and again, it's what we call an Ukimta. That means that if the three people were really together in a, in a space, it wouldn't be a problem at all. It would have to be that one was far away and the two of them were together. It's obviously still a little different than the Sota, because the Sota, nobody saw them, right? They only saw them go into the room. They didn't really see what happened there. Here he does at least see, but it's still considered private. Okay, next issue, Migalchenu Mivim. Now we're going to get to this issue of the Tiglachat, and how it relates, so remember, let's just review. There's an isur, lo takifu pe'at roshchen. Don't take off the pe'ot. But it's said with this word lo takifu. Takifu is to, to go around, which also, we talked about this before, perhaps there's, a, there's an opinion that perhaps the only issue is if you just cut your pe'ot, the side locks, but you leave the hair, Meaning you end up with this round, that's the word takifu, to make a round. You end up with like a circle kind of haircut, and maybe that's the issue. Maybe taking off all your hair is not an issue. But we did learn that many people say it is an issue, and it's just that the obligation of Nazir overrides the prohibition against cutting off your pay. Oh. So now the Gemara is going to question, and this is why I said it's a little difficult, because the first stage of shaving should be totally fine, because either right? You're a Nazir Tahor or you're a Nazir Tameh. So you definitely are allowed to shave because you definitely need to shave. The question is only the later stage, really. 
And like I said, it didn't say you shave in the later stage, but we'll go with the commentary that seems to say, we're assuming we're talking about the later stage. And then our question is the following. Maybe you weren't the one who was impure, in which case, the second shaving you're going to do is going to be forbidden because maybe you're a regular Nazir. You shaved the first time and now you can't shave off your peyot anymore. There's no obligation of Nazir upon you to shave. So how do we allow this? So Amr Shmuel, Bi'ishav katan. Again, another what we call Ukimta, where the Mishnah is only talking to certain people. The Mishnah is not talking to men who are grown men. There, It's only the part, now, the rest of it, yes, but the word migalchin, which is very interesting because you would think that the majority of cases of Nazirim and in general, the Mishnayot are often thinking of the man in the center. Here they're saying, oh, the Mishnah was actually just talking to women and children. Okay, women and minors, because minors don't have an obligation. Right? They're not going to be liable if they do it. So therefore, since there's a suffix here, we'll shave his head. And the women aren't obligated in Lotakifu. Right, that we'll see in a few minutes how we know that there's no there's no liability for a woman to shave off her peot. So now they say the following. Shmuel says this is a woman and a minor, but a man would not shave at all in this case, right? He would shave the first time, he wouldn't shave the second time. So now they say, the look be gadol. Why don't you just say that why didn't Shmuel say it's a gadol? And what? As I mentioned before, why doesn't he just why don't we just say hakafat kolarosh loshma kafa? Maybe this encircling your head by removing your peot is only a problem if you're leaving hair in a circle formation. But maybe if you take off all your hair, you remove everything, including the peot, maybe it's not forbidden. So they say the following. We're going to infer from the fact that Shmuel had to say, which we assume he only said as a last resort, it's talking about a woman and a minor, or women and minors, from the fact that he didn't say gadol and Hakafat kol arosh is not hakafa. Shema mina, we can infer from here. Kasavat Shmuel, hakafat kol arosh ma hakafa. We can assume that he thinks removing all the hair on your head, you would be going against this Torah prohibition. And it's not just this issue of having this ring around your head without the peot. So basically, we get rid of that. So we're left with that Shmuel says it's only a wo- women and minors okay, that do the shaving here. The rest of it is relevant to men, but not that line about the shaving. Marzutra says that thing that you said Shmuel said it's about women and minors it wasn't said about this Mishnah even though it would still be the same for this Mishnah but it was actually said Asefa on a later Mishnah and what Mishnah is this? This is the Mishnah we, re- we made reference to yesterday where it's the same idea we had a person who was a Nazir who was a Sephic maybe they were impure to a dead body maybe they were a leper and if you remember there every 30 days Right? They finish another section and they do a shaving. They do four shavings. Now, that would be the exact same question there. So, we have a Nazir who maybe became impure and maybe became a leper. Right? He can eat. He basically does the two shavings of the Mitzorah after 30 days and then after 60 days and then can eat sacrificial meat and they don't tell you the rest, but and then does another two sets for the impurity and then for the Nazir's completion. And he shaves four times. Same question. How could you shave four times if it's only a doubt? Maybe you were impure. Maybe you were Mitzorah. Theoretically, you should only shave once. The Haka of it, Hakafa, right? Isn't he doing the probi- Isn't he going against the prohibition of Hakafa? Amar Shmuel, Ishava Katan. So Shmuel says, ah, it's a wom- women and minors there. Okay? Only they would do the four shaving. Okay, so now we learn, right, something we said, caught us, took us obvious yesterday. Now we learned, oh, you don't really do the shavings. You just do the rest of the process, the sacrifices, etc. But you, or whatever part of the process we're going to see. We'll get to that whole thing, what exactly you do. But the shaving is really only done by the truth is you can't do the sacrifices either there. Anyway, we'll get to it there and we'll see. But he says the fact that you shave four times is going to basically be, uh, be for just women and minors. Last section for today, and this is the most interesting part, I think, of today's stuff in terms of personalities and, like I said, we're going to see Rav Huna's wife. Um, Shuli Mishka wrote an article in Flashback, both teaching about the history, some historical points about Rav Huna and Rav Adabarava, comparing this story to another place where Rav Huna's wife appears um, 
I would say she asks more questions than she answers, which often happens because there really aren't a lot of answers. But the comparison in and of itself is very interesting. So it's a definite worthwhile read for this week. Um, let's read the story. Amaravuna. So first, it's just a machloket. Hamakiva takatan hareuchayav. So we talked about minors and shaving of minors and shaving off their peot. And it seemed to be, right, if there's a doubt, then a minor would shave. Now we're just talking in general about minors and peot. So according to Rav Huna, not only, right, shouldn't you shave, if, if, well, let's put it this way, if you shave off the peot of a minor, you're liable, okay? Even though the minor wouldn't be liable because in the minor, <coughs> <clears throat> but if you shave off the peot, we're going to see later, he really only means men, okay? But if a man, let's say, who's commanded, don't take off peot, also can't take off the peot of other people. So, Amrle Rav Adbar Ava le Rav Huna. Now, Rav Adbar Ava says to Rav Huna, okay, one, one thing Shuli talks about is that you see with Rav Adbar Ava, even though his name is Son of Love, he was very, uh, a strong zealot, and his opinions come across very strongly. And here, he basically, number one, even though we don't see this inside yet, but it's important to understand, he disagrees with Rav Huna and thinks that actually you can take off if a minor doesn't have an issue himself to remove his payout because he won't be liable because he's a minor. Minors are never liable. Then it's actually not forbidden for you or anybody to remove the payout of this child. But Rav Huna said, it's forbidden. Okay? So he says to Rav Huna, Amalei Rav Adbar Ava Rav Huna, I see your children. They don't have peot. Who shaved off your children's peot? If anyone who shaves off the peot of a child is liable, then who on earth shaved off the peot of your children? To which Amar le Chova. Who's Chova? Chova's his wife. He says, my wife did it. My wife shaved off the peot. Now the reason Rav Huna is saying this is because Rav Huna believes that only someone who's commanded lo takifu is forbidden to take off the payout of the children. But women are not commanded, lo takifu. We're going to see this inside in a minute. I just want you to understand it at this point. Women are not commanded, so they're not liable if they shave off. Now, whether that means they should and can is a whole different question. And whether he's saying, my wife did it because it's allowed, you know, that's one thing, or, or my wife did it because she wouldn't be obligated, but maybe it's not the best thing anyway, right? Maybe we all know that People are very careful not to have their kids' payout cut off, even though they're minors. So anyway, whether he says, my wife did it, and I, I told my wife she should do it, or my wife did it, and, you know, like, she's going to do what she's going to do. I didn't get involved, which is another approach, um, right? It's always a question with rabbis when their wives don't follow halacha exactly the way they do. Is it that the husband said she could, or is it that the wife has her own mind of her own? She could do what she wants, right? And the, anyway, um, so Rav Adabar Ava is a little bit upset about this whole thing because he says, I don't get you. This is a little, you know, you're not allowed to do it, but it's okay if your wife does it. What's that all about? So he says the following, and this shows his zealous uh, attitude. Tikbirun chova lebaneha. Chova should bury her children. Okay? I'm reading it, and this is always the problem with translation. Either he's giving a curse, like, this is crazy. No. You have to remember, what's fascinating about this whole thing is Rav Adbarava thinks it's okay for Chova. He thinks it's okay for Rav Huna to shave the payout. But what he's saying is, according to you, you won't do the dirty work where you're letting your wife do it. Like, that doesn't seem right. And he's basically saying, according to you, this is a problem. Or he's saying, and then he's basically cursing her. Or maybe he didn't mean it as a curse, but maybe he's saying, according to your logic, she's really causing her son's death. Why is she causing her son's death? Because she's removing their payout. And if you think kids' payout shouldn't be removed by men, well, you know, it really means the kids' payout should be there. And she's removing them and causing the sons to sin by not having payout. So it's unclear exactly which way he's going here. Does he mean it as a curse or was he just saying, this is the result of her actions? Notice her name is Chova. Shuli suggests uh, one interpretation that um, you'll read it there, but, right, it's very interesting. Her name is Chova. Chova is liable, right? So it's interesting, maybe... You know, it's showing she's liable for, you know, doing something. Uh, I don't know. It's Anyway, it's an interesting thing to think about her name. It's a very odd name. Most people aren't named Chova. Anyway, the story goes on, and this is the, the interesting, and I would say hard part of the story. 
We know this very much from other Talmudic stories. You have to watch what you say, because often when you say things, whether he meant it as a curse or he didn't mean it as a curse, it became a curse. Kulu Interesting, they say Rav It really should be to Rav and Chova, right? Um, actually, I want to look at that bet. Maybe the bet adds Chova. Where does it go? There's so many different notes here. Bet, but Kamar Rishonim, yeah, it says Michova. Okay, it, it adds the word Micho, from Chova. So in any case, what happened? All the years is an interesting way the curse came true. While Rav Ad Rav was alive, none of the children of Chova and Rav Huna survived which seems to imply once he died, the curse was no longer in effect and they were able to have children. But very tragic. Considering that Ravad Rava didn't even agree with this whole halacha, it's very interesting, right? But he just thought that maybe Rav Huna was a little two-faced here. So now we're going to understand the machloket a little bit better. Michtei um, Travayhu, Svira, okay, it seems they both hold hakafat kol ma hakafa. Okay, taking off all the hair would be hakafa. But mamai kamifuge. What is the root of this debate, though? Rav Huna Saval lo takifu peat roshchem velo tashchit et peat zchancha. So in the same, in the same uh, pasuk, it says, "Don't take off the peot, right, and don't destroy the peav your zakan." Right. This is why we don't. Right. The halacha says you can't shave with a razor. Right. You can shave with a shaver, other methods, or some people don't shave at all based on this. Right. It all depends how you understand lo tashchit peat zchancha. But these are two commandments given in the same pasuk. What do we learn? What does Rav Huna learn from here? Koshe yeshlo hashchata, yeshlo hakafa. Anyone who has a beard to shave off is commanded not to remove their peot. But hane nashe, women, ho'il v'litnu hubashchata, since they don't have beards, even though they might have peot, litnu nami bakafa, the whole commandment of hakafa doesn't apply to them. And since it doesn't apply to them, they don't spell this out. But since it doesn't apply, it doesn't apply at all, not just to removing their own peot, but to removing other people's payout. So what this is basically saying is if, let's say, a man goes into a, a hair cutters and there's a Jewish woman or a Jewish man, okay, whether the hair cutters, if the hair cut is Jewish and they're male or female, it will make a difference, according to Rafuna. If the male cuts it off, the male is actually liable for removing someone else's payout. But the woman will not be reliable for removing the Jewish man's payout because she's not commanded. So right, it's a bit strange. And I think that's what Rabbi de Barava was bothered by. In the end, you're removing payout from someone who can't, right? Who who can't get their payout removed. So you're really doing something wrong, even though for you it's not wrong. It seems a little bit strange. So it's right. The it includes both the person who um, takes it off and the person, though, like you're ignoring the person who it gets taken off of. It basically connects these two. If the one who can't get the payout removed is liable, then the one who removes them is liable as well. Doesn't matter, man or woman. So therefore, a katan, a minor, who won't get, won't be liable for this, won't get punished. He's not in the realm of getting punished because he's young. So if a man removes them, a woman removes them, it doesn't matter. So basically, we have this machloka. Let's just review the machloka. We're going to stop here because then the Gemara is going to suggest maybe this whole thing about kafat kodal rosh is a machloka tanaim, and we're going to start it right to there. I'm going to leave that for tomorrow because we really barely started in today's stuff. So this is the end for today. What we basically have is this machloka. Besides the whole interaction that happened with them, where basically Rav Ada ends up cursing Rav Huna and his, um, his, his future children, really curses his wife and her future children. But we end up with this approach. Basically, Rav Huna says, if you, um, if you're liable, then you're liable for doing it to others. It has no effect on whether they're liable or not. So if you remove the payout of a minor, you're liable, okay? But only if you're, you yourself are, are commanded. So if you're commanded, you can't do it to someone else. Obviously, he doesn't say you can't do it to a woman who's not commanded, but a minor, because I guess a minor will grow up to, to be commanded, so you can't do it to a male minor. Whereas Rav Ada says it has nothing to do with your command, it has to do with the command of the one who's payout or being removed. And if you're removing the payout of someone who's liable, then you're liable for removing his payout. Male or female, it doesn't matter. So again, that would mean if you're a male 
grown person who goes to a hair cutters and a female or a male removes your hair, your sideburns, then basically they are liable. But if it's a minor, no one's liable, male or female, but it doesn't make a difference. So the whole distinction, and that's why Rav Adi got so upset with Rav Huna, because he doesn't distinguish male or female. Now, he doesn't think you'd be obligated anyway, but he says to Rav Huna, why on earth would you distinguish male or female? It all depends on the person whose hair you're shaving. Okay, so that's the, that's the interaction between them. Let's do a quick review of today's stuff. We started off with which is the halacha lemosh misinai? Is it the etzem kaseora that an ezir has to shave? Or is it the revi dam, the cordologa blood, that the Nazir doesn't shave for. And why does that override the Kavachomer, right? Is it that you can't derive a Kavachomer from a Halach Lemosh Misinai? Or you can derive whatever you want, but in the end, if it goes against a Halach Lemosh Misinai, it's not going to work. Then we have the case of the Tunis Zaglim. We have the whole process that they do. They basically do two sets of, they bring two sets of sacrifices up the first 30 days and stipulate this one for you and this one, right? Whichever one is supposed to go where. And then the second time, after another 30 days of being Nizirim, they bring one set between the two of them because altogether they're only liable three sets. And that's how they bring the three sets together in a way that kind of covers all their bases. And they shave, which later we said must be only for women and children because otherwise you'd have a problem with the shaving. Again, the first shaving seems to be okay. It would be at the second stage that it would be a problem, even though the Misha didn't say that the second stage, but we assume the Mishnah meant that there was a second stage. And then before we got to that of Shmuel of saying it was a minor and, and, and uh, women, we had this question of, isn't this Sefeq Tuma in a private, in a public space and Sefeq Tuma in a public space shouldn't be an issue at all, to which we said, oh, it must have been private and the one person standing there must have been somewhere else and looking in. And therefore it's, not con- it's still considered private and that's why we're strict here. And then like I said, we got into this issue of Shmuel, that it must be a minor or women. And from there, we got into that he must hold that shaving off all your hair includes the prohibition of shaving off your side locks because otherwise he could have had a much better answer, which is there's no problem of a Nazir of Lotakifu because it doesn't apply. The Nazir is taking off all their hair. And then we talked about the um, the taking off the, the liability for taking off the hair of a minor is that a problem or not? Does it depend if you're a man or a woman and you're commanded in this or not? And I see you're asking, Adina, I, I'm not 100% sure, but it seems to me that if you go get a haircut and they take off your payout, and they're also liable in the case, right, depending on who you hold by, but it seems like I think you would both be liable. And that's partially why they say the chova will bury her children because they're going to end up without cyburn. So there seems to be possibly a double liability here. Um, which is an interesting question. And yes, Julie, it does seem like barbers in Israel should attend this year, or Jewish barbers in general, to understand these halachot. Okay, again, this is not a halacha lamase class, so um, obviously there's different opinions here. With that, we'll finish for today. Have a great day, everybody.